the enemy threw more and more new forces at Sevastopol, seeking at all costs to capture it, to fulfill the order of Hitler's bet. But all their attempts crashed on the courage of the defenders of the city. Hitler's plan to capture Sevastopol collapsed. The fascist offensive was thwarted. On November 21, Hitlerites stopped storming Sevastopol, began to pull up reserves to somehow replenish their shattered units. The Black Sea fortress stood firm. Tens of thousands of enemy soldiers and officers found a grave at its walls. We used the respite to repair locomotives and armoured platforms, replenish ammunition. On the armoured platforms put some of the new weapons. One of the old guns was replaced by two new automatic guns. So on the second armoured platform, instead of four 82mm mortars, put three regimental, added, and machine guns. Now we have 18 of them. On eight kilometres of the main track made restoration work. All this personnel did it all on their own under the guidance of Golovinko and Andreev. They worked selflessly. Girls worked equally with everyone. If anyone tried to shift their labour on themselves, they took offence. We do not want to be dependents, but they voluntarily took on other, additional duties. Mended red fleet uniforms, washed linen, engaged in cleaning. Nina Ostrokova was especially diligent and hard-working. She worked as a stoker on the locomotive. For a girl it is not an easy labour, but Nina also helped to cook food, spread it, washed dishes. One day we were finishing lunch when the enemy aviation struck. The armoured train was safely sheltered in the tunnel, and we, not to suffocate from smoke in the underground, went out into the fresh air. As soon as the airplanes went into a dive, everyone hid in the shelter. Suddenly someone got worried. Where's Nina Ostrokova? So we rushed to the exit. Everyone was anxious for the girl. What about her? Is she alive? What was our surprise when we saw her with a pile of dishes in her hands? Shrapnel was whistling around, and she was collecting bowls and kettles left by us. Almost by force we dragged her into the tunnel. Work on repairing the track continued. The railroad workers built a new water dispenser. They stocked up on fuel. Primitive elevators were built for coal loading. In those days we were engaged not only in economic affairs. Sailors studied hard honing the skill of firing guns, mortars, machine guns. Girls also learned to shoot. Olya Doronkina mastered the machine gun best of all. At the same time, on the initiative of the Comso Bureau fighters, studied railroading to replace repairmen at any moment. In a few days, the armoured train again began to go out on combat missions. Commanders together with scouts scoured the entire front line. In every detail, studied the enemy's defence, strongholds and firepower. During the flights, they fired mainly from the Mackenzie of Heights and the Sheriff of Notch. So their firing was corrected by Lieutenant Smolchanov, and mayor off with a group of scouts. After each firing, the commander made a debriefing. The armoured train had a strong party organisation, headed by Vasily Andreevich Golovenko. Communists set the tone and in battle. In the days of the first assault on Sevastopol, party organisation has grown significantly. Young people joined the Komsomol. On the armoured platform's jerk. We have not yet applied to the Komsomol machine gunner Sikorsky and messenger cabin uncle Misha Silin. These are the youngest of our fighters, both of them are under 50. Mitrikov came to us, former commissar of the 1st Naval Regiment in Odessa, and now deputy chief of political department of coastal defence. We met with him as relatives. But I was excited by this meeting not only because I saw my dear man again, there was another reason. He came to us to check how we work with people. We all valued the opinion of such an experienced political officer. Mitrakov was satisfied with the activities of Commissar Porozov and the party organization. He also praised the Komsomol members of the armored train. They often write about us in the newspapers. Each such article Commissar Porozov reads aloud, and then we discuss it together. The newspapers write that the sailors of the armored train honorably carry on their banner, the name of the legendary hero of the Civil War, Anatoly Zheliznyakov, and rightfully occupy an honorable place among the brave defenders of Sevastopol. It is pleasant to hear such things. Since during a break, we were brought a new movie. It was called Heroic Sevastopol. It showed the battles at Ishan positions, where the Marines courageously held back the onslaught of fascist gangs. The picture from the very first frames attracted attention. Two attention fighters looked at the reflection of the enemy attack, fiercely firing machine guns. Squinting their eyes, machine gunners are shooting. Shells and mines are bursting around, everything is drowned in grey dust mixed with smoke. 
And here, the most exciting moment. Marines, having taken off their coats and put on dashing caps, suddenly jumped out of the trenches and rushed at full height into the counterattack. The impression was as if we ourselves were running together with the infantrymen, firing furiously, shouting with all the power of sailors' throats half under. Hurrah, here they have already reached the enemy trenches wielding bayonets and butts. We see how the fascists, leaving the dead and wounded, shamefully flee. Strong, stunning footage. This is exactly the same way the defenders of Odessa were bayoneting, the thought flashed. How brave, fearless a cameraman must be to film such episodes. After all, he had to be in the trenches of the front line to shoot under a hail of bullets and shrapnel, together with the soldiers to run into the attack. The images of battle were replaced by everyday episodes. On the screen, close-up showed those who had just withstood the onslaught of the Nazis and won in a decisive battle, and suddenly I see a familiar face. Under the visor of a steel helmet, slightly squinted eyes, in the hands of a machine gun, on the shoulders thrown over the cloak tent. Trust machine gun ribbons on his chest, a grenade on his belt. Kostya Ryashentsev, I recognized before the announcer called his name. The very same machine gunner whose portrait I had seen on Premorsky Boulevard. Well, I was not mistaken then. Not only the appearance of this fighter, but also his military deeds epitomized the image of the defender of Sevastopol. The movie made an unforgettable impression on everyone and each Shelesnya Kulvitz felt his responsibility for the fate of his native city even more strongly. When we left the darkened room, the sun was already slipping towards the horizon. The wind that had risen since morning had subsided. The armoured train stood at the entrance to the gypsy tunnel. From the pipes of steam locomotives waved a light white smoke. It's waiting for the reconnaissance. The team is preparing to leave. While there is a little free time, I gather members of the Komsomol Bureau. At our meeting come and the commander and commissar. The first question about the recommendation to the party Boris Kozhetov. Comrades asked the lieutenant to tell his autobiography. Slightly above average height, military-style trim, he stood up, looked around. His big black eyes seemed to ask what to talk about when the biography is just beginning. He once again looked at his comrades and smiled his amazing white tooth smile. He spoke with a barely perceptible Ukrainian accent and was visibly worried as if he was afraid of missing or understating something particularly important. I was born in Poltava region, in a peasant family. His father died in the Civil War. He went to the Navy on the Komsomol recruitment, graduated from college, became a commander. He was in the war from the first day. His baptism of fire was at Oshakov, now Tiarama a train. The lieutenant's story was supplemented by his comrades. They talked about his character, excellent knowledge of artillery, and also about the fact that his armoured train in every battle causes tangible damage to the enemy. The commander of the armoured train also spoke. He recalled the case when Koshetov, seeing that there was no one at the guns, himself stood up to the gun and opened fire on an airplane. I rebuked him thus. The commander of the armoured platoon should not turn into a gunner and lock gunner. But actually the lieutenant did the right thing. His example had a strong effect. There was no trace of confusion among the sailors. Members of the Bureau unanimously decide to give Komsomol Kochitov recommendation to the party. The meeting was coming to an end when the duty officer reported that the commander and a member of the military council of the Primorsky army had arrived on the armoured train. In a few minutes the whole crew lined up in the tunnel. General I. A. Petrov thanked the Zelezniakovites for their active assistance to the infantry units. The infantry is satisfied with your combat work. So they asked me and Brigade Commissar Kuznetsov to give you a heartfelt thank you. Hmm, said the general. And we also came to give you gifts, which the people sent to the defenders of Sevastopol. The commander showed his hand to the car, the back of which was loaded with parcels. So Brigade Commissar M. G. Kut and Zef congratulated the Zelezniakovsi with combat successes, told about the latest news at the front and in the country, answered the questions of the Red Fleet and commanders. Each sailor was given a parcel. We opened them with excitement, even if their contents were not simple. Warm socks, mittens, pouches, fly ash, sausage, cookies, handkerchiefs, toilet soap, cologne, but all this was warmed by hot love and care of strangers and so dear to us. Each parcel contained a letter. Letters were from girls, schoolchildren and the dearest, from mothers, our soldiers and sailors' mothers. Scanty lines, but how much faith in the victory in those who defend the freedom and happiness of the people. 
Scots people on the home front told about their labour, but not a single letter complained about the difficulties, about the lack of food, about the fact that you have to work in the shops from morning till evening, or even twenty-four hours to give the front arms, ammunition, uniforms. Sailors read these letters, and many of them made their eyes moist. Hello, our distant dear Uncle Warrior, in block letters. Tanya writes to you. I am seven years old. My mum died when we evacuated in a bombing raid. My dad is at the front. We live with my grandmother. It's blizzarding outside. And Grandpa knits socks and mittens for you so you won't be cold. After all, you're at the front defending us. When you defeat the Nazis, come and visit us in the north, and perhaps in Ukraine when we come back. In my parcel, cigarettes, soap, woolen socks, a scarf, cologne, and even a quart of alcohol. On top is an envelope. In it is a letter and a photograph of a young girl. A young, beautiful face, wide open eyes staring at me rapturously and trustingly. The girl, distant and unfamiliar, writes to the frontline warrior. I work at the Orsk meat processing plant, replaced my father, a communist. He voluntarily went to the front. He was not taken, as we have six souls of underage children. I, the eldest, am sixteen years old, and my mother is sick. And we know that it is necessary. The director of the mill is a very good man, helps us. I work well. I get bonuses. I have to work twelve and fourteen hours a day. Other times we don't leave the shops for weeks, but I do not get tired. I am glad that my labor helps you. That's what our director says. I have a great joy. I was accepted into the Komsomol. I really want to study at the nursing courses organized at the plant. My dear distant warrior, beat the fascists, don't leave them on our land. Come back with victory, come to us in Orsk. We will be very happy to see you. Schnaufer. I read it and somehow joyful warmths became on my soul. Memories of home, of distant childhood, came flooding back. Childhood. It wasn't easy. I was born in the formidable year of 1918, when the civil war was burning all over the country. See, and the Skinsky Bridge through our village Petrenkovo, the Kresnovsky gangs were attacking from across the Don. There was heavy fighting. Father, after a severe wound and illness, was at home, but that night he went into the woods. He knew well that the village Kulaks would not forgive him, a red commander, for his active work to establish Soviet power on the Don. The Krasnovsi took the village. Together with the Kulaks, they immediately began brutal massacres of village activists. They didn't miss our house either. They dug up everything, looking for my father. They beat up my mother and grandmother. They ambushed the house for the night. The family knew that my father was about to come to pick us up and take us to his relatives on the farm Dovshik. Everyone was at a loss except Grandma Mavra. She drank moonshine to the two soldiers who remained in the ambush, and they fell asleep peacefully. At night the father came, took the family and led them through the vegetable gardens to the bridge. It was raining non-stop. Everyone was soaked to the skin. My father hid me behind his back. I wasn't even a week old yet. There was pandemonium on the bridge. Thousands of refugees were trying to cross to the other side of the Don as quickly as possible, in order not to fall into the hands of Krasnovsky's punishers. The white guards opened fire. Under the pressure of the crowd collapsed railing, many fell into the river. My father fell into the water with me and my older brother Misha. My mother and her two children returned home. No sooner had she warmed up than the counterintelligence officers came. She was immediately interrogated. They beat her, tortured her, questioned her about her father. Then they threw her into the cellar and looted everything that was at home. My father, despite being wounded, still managed to stay on the water and then get ashore with me. My older brother drowned. Soon my father joined the Red Army. Nurses took patronage over me and rested me from death. A day later, having received reinforcements, our troops went on the offensive. My father led a detachment through the riverbeds. The Biliaks did not foresee that the Reds would be on this side and were sleeping serenely. The village was liberated. See, every boy in our village knew this story. My peers called me Kolkoi Bajonovsi because I wore an old Budionov helmet for a long time. When you grow up, Kolka, you will be a military man. It was not for nothing that you were in the icy dome font and under the Krasnov shrapnel. His words came true. True, I did not become a cavalryman like my father, but I tried to fight in such a way that he, the holder of three St. George's crosses and the owner of a saber presented by Budeni, was not ashamed of his son. While I was reminiscing, the Red Fleet men gathered around me. Vanya Shaposhnikov came too. He was holding a letter. 
Yeah, come, Sorg, read it. Vanya got a good heartfelt letter. I read it aloud, I know you're a brave fighter. I'm reading, and I'm watching Shaposhnikov out of the corner of my eye. He even turned pale with excitement. Red, petty officer, red, me, he hurries me. I'm proud of your courage, military courage. I believe you will achieve victory, clear our land from fascist invaders. Said the sailors listen attentively to what the letter says. It is addressed to each of them, and to all those who defend our great Soviet motherland with weapons in their hands. Ivan Shaposhnikov is the first to break the silence. No, secretary, let me say a few words. He climbs up on the platform and tears off the cap from his head. I know you're a brave fighter, that's not me. But I swear, as long as I have enough strength, I'll beat the fascists to my last breath, and I won't be ashamed to receive such letters. After Shaposhnikov, Petty Officer Dmitrienko went up to the armoured platform. So after such letters I want to rush into battle now, May he raised several envelopes above his head and said, These are not simple letters, the people are writing them, and we will fulfil their will. For the burned cities and villages, for the ruined land, for the tears and blood of Soviet people we will avenge the Hitlerites with a fierce punishment. Other sailors also took the floor. They spoke passionately, swore to smash the enemy even more mercilessly. The commander and a member of the military council came out of the car and watched our spontaneous rally with interest. Then the brigade commissar turned to the sailors. You have spoken very well. Let's hope that in the coming days you will be able to confirm your words with deeds. The guests left. The sailors went to their places. I took out Clava's photograph again and read the letter. Clava, Clava. What a nice and sweet girl you must be. Could it be that you would just slip into my fate without leaving a trace? And even then I realized that the image of this girl will always remain in my heart. And so it was. And I am eternally grateful to fate that it was me who received the parcel of a wonderful girl. The very one who after the war became the companion of my life. My On December 8, the armored train went to the position to the Kamishlovsky Bridge. It was to support Colonel Vilshansky's brigade with fire. That day it was doing reconnaissance in the area of Height 74.4. Artillery preparation began. As attack aircraft came, they went low over the ground, sowing fire and leaving black traces of bursts. The commandos did not stop firing. One of the planes spiked so low that it seemed that it would never come out of the dive, but at the very ground it suddenly soared, and in the same second machine gun bursts raked the platform, raising fountains of rusty dust. The raid lasted for several minutes, but it did not bring much damage to the armoured train. Only after the command stand down the news spread around the battle stations, Captain Sahakian was wounded. During the raid he was controlling the firing from the open area of the command post. He was wounded at the very beginning of the battle, but he continued to direct the combat actions of the crew until he lost consciousness. And then the word spread through the armoured train. The commander is wounded. This news shocked everyone. Everyone wanted to know as soon as possible what was the condition of the commander, whether there was any hope for rescue. But only after returning to the parking lot the commissar gathered the personnel and told them how it was. The plane stormed off. Anti-aircraft gunners had already driven them away. The captain commanded stand down. I wanted to say something to him. I looked and he was falling. I didn't even have time to support him. And there was a pool of blood on the deck beneath him. The sailors were silent and sullen. Pity the captain. Everyone loved him. In the evening, when we arrived in Sevastopol, the wounded commander was sent to the hospital. The command of the armoured train temporarily assumed Senior Lieutenant Tchaikovsky. The duties of the assistant began to perform Koshetov. With them we went out several times on combat trips, and five days later arrived a new commander of the armoured train, Engineer Captain Lieutenant Karchenko. Usually it is difficult to get used to a new commander, but Mikhail Fedorovich quickly won our respect. Cold alienation melted after we learned his biography. In the Civil War, he, 17-year-old boy, joined the Red Guard detachment of Mokrusov and worked his way up from a private soldier to commander of the armoured train Hurricane, awarded the Order of the Red Banner. In peacetime, he worked as a ship mechanic and ship repair technician. From the very first day between the commander and the commissar established such relations, which should be in people who are entrusted with the fate of many soldiers. They have a lot in common. Both fought in the Civil War, 
They both have a large and harsh school of life. Karchenko fought under the command of Voroshilov. Porozov mastered the art of party political work under the leadership of Commissar Fermanov. Karchenko always spoke quickly, as if afraid of something not to finish, and when he was worried, began to stammer, gave a sign of the contusion. Porozov, on the contrary, he weighed every word, spoke slowly, but behind every word he spoke you could feel the rightness and conviction. Sir Commissar Tsar and the commander complimented each other in the best possible way, and although both enjoyed the same rights, Karchenko felt that the senior on the armoured train is Porozov, and did not oppose it. I met with my friends from Odessa, Noah Adamia and Yasha Stridzhak. Having found out where the armoured train was standing, they dropped by my place. The guests were immediately surrounded by comrades. Shelesnyakovs were interested in the front line, and friends had something to tell. The fame of sniper Noah Adamia rattled all over Sevastopol. Newspapers often wrote about the fearless gun commander Yakov Stritschak. Both had already been awarded orders. We remembered Odessa, battle friends, fallen comrades. Pitoki Serdachikir was especially happy. He took his soul, talked to Noah in his native Georgian language, which he had missed. He was the only Georgian on the armored train. Karchenka came up. I introduced my friends. They told me that at the front line they knew about the armoured train's military affairs and admired the bravery of Zelezniakov's men. It was pleasant for both the commander and all of us to hear such words. The commander allowed me to escort Noah and Yakov, and here we go through the streets of Sevastopol. It's hard to recognise the city. There are piles of rubble everywhere, smoky unhealed fires. You can't see people. The city has gone underground. Enterprises, hospitals, institutions, stores, canteens moved to cellars and tunnels. On Karl Marx Street we had a snack in an underground canteen. We watched a movie in an underground theatre, and even took a photo in the underground photo studio. The city lives. In the evening we parted having agreed to meet more often, but we did not see each other again. Noah Adamir, who became a famous sniper hero of the Soviet Union, died in the last days of the defence of the city. Yasha Strijak, an artilleryman also died a brave death on the Sevastopol land. The respite at the front was not long. Having suffered defeat after the first battles, the fascists regrouped again, pulled up fresh units from other areas and began to prepare for a new assault. The enemy aviation became more active. Heavy batteries, tank formations appeared, but our command skillfully used the respite. Formed new units and subdivisions, replenished weapons and ammunition, strengthened the approaches to Sevastopol. The morale of the defenders of the city was raised by the victories of our troops at Tikvin, Rostov. Most of all, we were happy to hear the news about the defeat of the German troops near Moscow. None of us knew when the new Nazi offensive on Sevastopol would begin, but everyone was ready to meet it in all arms. And on December 17, everything rumbled again. The enemy began the second assault on the Black Sea stronghold. Again, choking on their own blood, the fascists climbed on Sevastopol, hoping to break the heroic garrison. But the enemies miscalculated this time too. Sailors stood to the death. In those days, very popular was a song by an unknown poet on the motif, The Sea is Spread Why. And with his chest covered his native Sevastopol, sailor, infantryman and pilot. At the strong wall of steel defense, a raider finds a grave. The military council of the Black Sea appealed to the defenders of the sea sea. The attention of not only the peoples of the USESR, but also the attention of the peoples of the world, who day and night watch the Battle of Sevastopol, the heroism of its defenders. Defend our native Sevastopol to the last drop of blood. The motherland expects us to defeat the enemy. Victory will be for us. The fascists put into battle seven divisions, two mountain rifle brigades, 150 tanks and a large amount of artillery. Especially hot battles broke out in the area of the mountain Arzizoba and in the Belbek Valley, where the enemy with the forces of two divisions struck the main blow. Defended here were units of the 8th Marine Brigade of Colonel Vilshansky and 95th Infantry Division of Major General Vorobov. From the first day of the assault we were ordered to support these units. Standing in position at the Shavrovaya Hollow, the armoured train, on the orders of the Chief of Artillery of the Maritime Army, Colonel Rishi opened fire on the advancing enemy infantry in the area of Mount Aziz Ober. The armoured train was commanded by the Assistant Commander Senior Lieutenant Tchaikovsky. Captain Lieutenant Karkenko did not interfere with fire control. 
and I'll have another day or two to look around. I'll be trained, and then I'll take command, he frankly said. We had no such guns during the Civil War, and we had no idea about mortars. We were firing almost continuously. We hit in volleys with short intervals. The echo rumbled in the valley, and merging with a new volley, created a formidable melody of the fascist shells now, and then destroyed the railroad bed, but brave repairmen under enemy fire restored the situation, and the armoured train again and again rushed to the front line. The advantage in forces was on the side of the enemy. Despite the heroism of people, the fascists were advancing to the city. The front line approached the Kamyshlovsky Bridge. The zone of action of the armoured train was reduced. More and more often we had to put mortars into action. The enemy were so close to us. We tried to save the cannons, they were very worn out. In the following days the armoured train also used machine guns. When the enemy infantry attacked on the northern slopes of the Belbeck Valley, the armoured train jumped out of the Mackenzie notch and opened fire with mortars and machine guns, three five minutes of hurricane fire, and the enemy flees, leaving the dead and wounded, and the armoured train again disappears into cover until the next raid. Of course it's risky, but Mikhail Fedorovich's risk is based on precise calculation, that's when we were convinced of the courage of our new commander. We will use the experience of the Civil War, he said. We will use all the weapons we have, down to the rifles. The control platforms of the armoured train were also turned into firing points. Their sides were covered with sandbags. All those who were not busy at the guns and mortars, railroad workers, communicators, housekeepers, settled here, as in the trenches with rifles and grenades. On December 22, a critical situation was created at the site of the 388th Infantry Division, defending the Mackenzie of Mountains. To help it was thrown 79th Separate Brigade of Marines under the command of Colonel Potapov, who had just arrived on ships from Novorossiysk. To let the brigade deploy, the commander of the armoured train ordered Lieutenant Golovenko and me to take all available fighters and hold the Hitlerites at the Mackenzie of Cordon. In a few minutes, 35 sailors armed with machine guns and grenades stood at the entrance to the Gypsy Tunnel. Golovenko led us along the stony road to the Cordon. We did not pass a kilometre, as from behind the hill appeared retreating fighters. They were retreating to the tunnel. And the heights and station Mackenzie V Mountains everywhere was firing. The artillery cannonade rumbled without ceasing. Our platoon was walking in a chain towards the retreating. At that time an armoured train jumped out of the tunnel and, gaining speed, moved towards the stinger. Goledenko stopped and shouted into a megaphone, addressing the retreating soldiers. Stop! Not a step back! The Red Army soldiers stopped. Follow me forward. Golovenko continued to command and was the first to rush to the height. And at once the people's confusion disappeared. Encouraged, they, together with the sailors, rushed after the lieutenant. And on the right an armoured train was gaining speed, aiming its guns at the station. Hitlerites did not expect such an onslaught, and although they are still fiercely resisting, the fighters beat away from them one position after another. Meanwhile, Marines from Potapov's brigade came up. They joined the ranks of the Red Army, and we all speed up our run, trying to keep up with the armoured train. And it is already flying into the station, where the enemy troops are piled up. For the first time I see my armoured train from the side, shrouded in fire and smoke. It brings down on the enemy the full power of its guns, mortars and machine guns. Around him everything falls, collapses, burns. Daring raid as Elesnyakov stunned Hitlerites. It did not occur to them that we would risk to break into the thick of their troops. They placed columns of tanks and automobiles with military equipment at the station. Even the camp kitchens were brought up for lunch. The armoured train was firing from both sides, sweeping away and crushing everything on its way. Hitlerites in horror scattered from the railroad, offering no resistance. They did not even have time to start the tanks, and their column remained on the highway. At a dead end a huge tank with fuel exploded and everything around went up in flames. After us infantrymen rushed into the station, and, without delay, rushed forward, pushing the Hitlerites to the Kamishlovsky Bridge. The positions lost earlier were restored on the approaches to the Kamishlovsky Bridge. The railroad bed was destroyed, and the armoured train stopped our platoon, having fulfilled its task, returned to the armoured train, where everything bore the traces of the just-ended battle. The platforms of the armoured platforms were piled with shell casings. The paint was smoking on the hot gun barrels, despite the sharp frosty wind. 
The barrels did not have time to cool down, and our girls threw wet blankets and overcoats over them. Taking advantage of the short lull, the Zelezniakov summarized the results of the battle, especially distinguished gun crews Danilich and Drozdov. They suppressed an artillery battery on the approaches to the station and opened the way for the armored train. Set the guns of Danilich in the heat of battle, the locking mechanism failed, but the commanders did not stop firing. They manually opened the lock and continued to shoot at the fascists. Lavrenty Fisan, Boris Grishko and Vasily Tereshenko did not fail in the battle. When one of the tanks turned around to shoot at the locomotive, they shot it at point-blank range with their 100mm cannon. The marines thanked the Zelezniakovs from the bottom of their hearts. One of the commanders approached our armoured platform. Thank you, dear comrades, from all our fighters. Worried, he said. If it were not for you, it would have been difficult for us. Earthly bow to you. Having given Potapov's men a new foothold, Zelezniakov returned to Mackenzie v. Gori station. Here everything bore the traces of all destroying fire of the fortress on wheels. The black, scorched ground was strewn with corpses. The burning hulks of tanks and automobiles were rising. Everywhere piles of different property, abandoned in panic by the enemy. Yes, the fascists are in trouble. It's the battle for the station Mackenzie v. Gori and the surrounding area lasted four hours. It was one of the most successful our raids on the enemy during the defense. On this direction, the enemy threw more than a third of his forces at Sevastopol. But it was not the superiority in strength and equipment that decided the victory, but the strength of spirit, the will to victory of our Soviet sailors of the Black Sea, and although in some areas our troops still had to squeeze on 300, 400 meters, these meters were strewn with hundreds of fascist corpses. The armored train was about to return to the Gypsy Tunnel when the terrible news spread through the armored platforms. Six mutilated corpses of our soldiers were found at the station in one of the abandoned barns. Chen Tsar Porozov order. Every member of the crew must see what the fascist perverts had done. One by one, the Zelizniakovs passed the tortured Red Army men. They lay undressed with their stomachs cut open and their faces mutilated. Silently, without a word, we looked at the corpses of our comrades, at the villainous deeds of perverts in human form. Gritting our teeth and clenching our fists, each of us gave ourselves a holy oath to avenge the anonymous martyrs. We will not forget, we will not forgive. With this thought, we returned to the armored train to go to battle again and punish the enemy for all his crimes. The next morning, as soon as we left the tunnel, the signal man reported. There's a scout in the air. Directly above us, at a considerable height, hovered a lone frame, a two-fuselage Fokke wolf. It seemed that the scout was just waiting for the armored train to appear in the open. Ominously shining in the rays of the rising sun, he circled above us and flew away. But for a long time there was a nasty howling sound in our ears. And in ten minutes a whole squadron of bombers appeared in the air. It was risky to engage them, and the commander ordered to return to the tunnel. The train was already entering the shelter when strong explosions were heard around. Large caliber bombs were dropped. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Only a few splinters cut into the armor plating of the tail locomotive. We repaired the track at the entrance to the tunnel and again went out on a combat flight. And again, everything was repeated. The enemy scout reported to his airfield about the appearance of the armored train and the bombers were not slow to arrive with a deadly load. One after another, they plunged down on us. After the battles for the station, Mackenzie v. Gori Hitlerites did not take their eyes off our armored train. Their artillery shot the tunnel exits. Planes are dropping dozens of tons of bombs here, trying to block us. And yet Zelezniakov is still operating. The commander of the Seaside Army has allocated a special sapper battalion to clear the rubble and repair the destroyed track. The team of the armored train had no time to cope with this work. Until the end of December, the enemy was rampaging. Heavy, bloody battles were fought in all parts of the defense. The armored train was still almost every day going out on trips, supporting our units with intense fire. Semi strong fights took place on December 24. In the afternoon, the fascists went on the offensive on the approaches to the Mackenzie Mountains. They time and again attacked the front edge of our defenses. Tanks entered the battle. Our armored train was assigned the task to deliver a fire attack on the enemy in this area. But we still need to send there an adjuster replied the commander. There he is. Indeed, soon the armored train began to receive extremely accurate data for firing, 
Any artillerim would be jealous. When the battle was over, Lieutenant Kushatov to me and, smiling, how is Ye, do you know who we were supporting now? It is known. Marines or Primoskians? But who exactly? He paused, apparently counting on the effect. I remained silent in bewilderment. My Captain Golovin, Koshitov said solemnly. It turns out that after the battle, when the infantrymen thanked the Zelezniakovs for the rescue, Commissar Porozov, me, who corrected your fire? I did, mm, came the reply. Captain Golovin? So that's where our Leonid Pavlovich is now. He commands a rifle battalion in Vilshansky's brigade. Again our scouts went to the Mikhenziev Mountains. There they were met by Colonel Potapov. He told in detail about the actions of enemy mortar batteries noted on the map their location. Together with Zorin, Molchanov, Mayorov, Kozakov and Myashin, the scouts of Potapov's brigade went there. Carefully camouflaged, reached the place. They quickly palanged the landmarks, additionally found two bunkers, immediately put them on the map. Returning to the armored train, Zorin reported in detail to the commander about the results of the reconnaissance. Days of alarm. In two minutes the armored train was ready for battle, and in a few minutes we were already approaching the initial positions. The fascists are shooting at the armored train. Our scouts on the move bearing their firing points. On visible landmarks gun commanders open fire. Dozens of mines, shells burst at the targets. The debris of fortifications, bunkers fly up. Hitlerites are rushing like rats in a trap. The whole height is riddled with craters of our shells and mines. From there no more will not talk no more neither zotes nor mortar batteries. The airplanes appear, but they do not risk to descend. The Nazi pirates already know that the anti-aircraft gunners of the armored train can shoot accurately. The bombs fall haphazardly and do us no harm. Shelesnyakov safely returns to the shelter. It's the next day, a new task. Major General Morganov called our commander and reported that from the Belbek Valley to the front line approached large enemy forces. They are accumulating at the height and set up a mortar battery there. To Distin de Trine was assigned the tykes. To destroy the enemy's manpower and mortar battery by fire. Together with Zorin, the commanders of the armored train and Lieutenant Golovenko went on reconnaissance. He was given a special task. To check the condition of the road in the area of the Kamishlovsky Bridge. We saw our comrades off. The engine of the train rumbled and it disappeared in the night gloom. Before the return of the scouts, the commander ordered everyone except for the watch service to re- I took the opportunity to gather the members of the bureau. Several comrades asked for recommendations to the party. It was necessary to talk about the work of agitators and other Komsomol affairs. Only at twelve o'clock at night we went to rest, but for some reason I did not sleep. I took out the photos of my relatives from my pocket. I remembered that I hadn't written home for a long time, and they might think God knows what, in the dim light of the blue bulb. The only light in the carriage when people are asleep. I bent over a piece of paper. What to write? I'm alive, I'm healthy, I'm beating the Nazis. I don't think there's anything else to write, and my father might be offended that I didn't write enough. He likes it when I tell about combat operations in detail. But what could I tell about now? The fascists are at the walls of Sevastopol. They are moving inland with a formidable force. Will we not survive? Will we not win? No, it can't. I sent greetings to my relatives and friends. Then I wrote, Father, don't worry, I'm fine. I kiss you, my dear old man. He thought a little more and put the only photo in envelope, a memory of the meeting with Adamia and Stryshak. He wrote on the back of the envelope, If I die in battle, remember my son a sailor. And immediately crossed out these words, No, I won't. It's not so easy to destroy the Zelezniakov. How many times these words were remembered later, in the most difficult moments of my life, when it seemed that nothing could prevent death, I said them, gritting my teeth, and found the strength to win, to stay alive. I sealed the envelope, wrote the address, and I felt better, as if I had talked to my relatives and friends. I lay down on the bed and immediately closed my eyelids. My thoughts were rushing somewhere far away, at home. In my dream I saw a wonderful summer morning. Everything was green. Flowers and grass washed with fresh dew. Birds chirping merrily. I'm about five years old. I'm in a red shirt. My father carries me on his shoulder. We're going to the gourds behind the village. We have to climb a big hill. It's hard for my father. No, dee. Dad, I'll go by myself. Sit down, little birdie. Just don't dangle your legs. Sizipone rang on the wall. 
The duty officer reminded me it was time to change him. I left the warm carriage and hurried to the armoured train. The yard is dark, clouds are low, overhanging. In the darkness the wind howls drearily, so the cold gets to my bones. The sentry called, recognised my voice and let me through. On the platform replaced Petty Officer Greyev. Soon the commander came to the CP. What a cold, he shivered. Aren't you freezing here? Something long no scouts, you always wait for them with anxiety. The commander sat down, lit a cigarette. He asked about his relatives, about home, talked and told a little about himself, about how he met with Franz when he commanded the armoured train Hurricane, how he beat Petura, Denikin, chased Mukno, established Soviet power in the Cuban. Yes, it is not terrible to go into battle with such a man, a man of great soul, protects each of us like a father, brave, judicious, intelligent, and I suddenly wanted to tell him about my father who, like him, fought for the Soviet power in the Civil War. The commander listened attentively. You see, he said, when I was silent, it is written on your fate to defend the cause for which your father spilled blood. You too have shed a lot of it, but there are great challenges ahead of us. A commander's warm word, how much it means to a soldier. No matter how tired you are, no matter how hard it was on your soul, but the commander comes, talks to you, says a warm word, and it becomes easier, as if you talked to your own father. And how much mental vigor gave us communication with the commissar. Many times he talked to me, either during night duty, or discussing Komsomol affairs, or just in his free time between... Pyotr Agafonovich told us about his participation in the partisan movement in the Piskov region during the Civil War, about how he and his comrades had blown up two railroad bridges on the way to Petrograd, about how Soviet power had been restored in seven occupied volosts behind German lines, and how from there, across the front line, they had sent grain carts to the capital. These stories were reminiscent of my father's memories, and this brought me even closer to the commissar. He was like a father to all of us here, not because of his position, but because of his generosity. Tyotr Agafonovich also had a son, and his name was Lenka. He was 19 years old, and he studied at the Perm Aviation School. Yes, we have good commanders, Karchenko and Porozov. They never raise their voices at the Red Fleet, calm, balanced, care. Our conversation went on for a long time but then we heard a barely discernible murmur of the engine. A railroad car? Having looked at the pocket watch Pavel Buer, a gift from Blucher, the commander stood up. Well, we've slept a little, that's enough. Raise the team, petty officer. The battle alarm instantly shook up the men. A few minutes later, I already reported that the armoured train is ready for the march. The scouts went up to the commander's cabin. Zorin began to report the situation. Koshetov and Butsenko, leaning over the map, clarified, supplemented. In the valley near the village, noticeable enemy movement detected a column of vehicles. On the right slope of the height, 300 meters from the destroyed mosque, in the dense bushes, two mortar batteries. In the mosque, machine gun point, one mortar battery moved forward to our front line. And in the mosque put machine guns, laughed Garkenko. Not badly settled in a holy place, but it's unlikely that the saints will help them. But uh, well done, boys. Already turning to the scouts, concluded the commander. We did not go scouting for nothing. The map lying in front of him was covered in many places with crosses. These places were supposed to fire. Yes, indeed, the scouts tried. In camouflage robes hiding between the bushes, Zorin, Kozakov, Fizen, Kokshetov and Butsenko snuck almost close to the enemy positions and scouted to the details of the location of fascist equipment. Golovenko stayed with the train, which in case of danger had to jump forward and cover the scouts with fire. Everything was worked out to the last detail. However, the help of machine gunners was not needed. The scouts saw everything and returned safely. It's on the state of the railroad and Kamishlovsky Bridge, reported Golovenko. The line was mostly serviceable. Only in two places it was necessary to change the rails. The bridge was worse. It needed repair, but under enemy fire it was practically impossible. Well, now, as they say, to places to stand, to take off the anchor, ordered the commander and got up from the table, and at once the internal communication calls rang out. Zeleznikov rushed to where the enemy was entrenched and preparing to attack. It's still dark, a little glimmer of dawn, snowflakes are cold on the face, telegraph poles glimmer, wheels rattle on the bends of the road. Golovenko and Andreev are looking ahead, whether the road is in order. 
Toyakov, Popov, Delanin, and Matyush are driving the armored train. Calculations of commanders, mortarmen, machine gunners in full readiness. The guns are loaded, barrels are directed towards the enemy. Armored train approaches the target closer and closer. Here is the front line. Marines, seeing the armored train, rise from the trenches, waving their hats affably. The commander angrily transmits to the head locomotive. Remove the smoke, and a little later, small stroke. The smallest? But the enemy still managed to find us. His artillery is firing furiously. We have to change position. Term jerks and rushes forward again. Enemy shells and mines burst around with howling and rumbling. Splinters cut into the armor. A shell hits the corner of the first armored platform. Shrapnel wounded too. Commander Danilish in the head and arm, loading Vasya Zelensky in the shoulder. Na take cover behind the turret. Kochetov commands. Felchenechayev assists the wounded on the spot and directs them to the infirmary. Danilich refuses. As long as my head holds, I'm not going anywhere. But the loader must be replaced. But Zelensky also remains at his post. The bombardment zone has passed. The armored train stops at a new position. And at once all our cannons are again. The German positions are as if in the palm of our hands. We see how shells and mines are bursting, how Hitlerites are fleeing, escaping from the explosions. Fire is transferred to mortar batteries, bunkers, deep into the ravine. A few volleys and fascist batteries are silenced. The next target is a mosque. In a minute a black column of smoke and flame rose on the place where it stood. Under the ruins found a grave fascist machine guns and their calculations. From here they will go straight to paradise, joked machine gunners. Hitlerites are still trying to hinder the armored train, but their fire is getting weaker by the minute. From the incessant firing of Danilik's gun the spring of the reel has burst, and after each shot the loader Maya Shin burning reels the gun manually. The gun barrels are heated, the paint is burning on them. Uncle Misha Silin, a messenger of the wardroom, Sasha Nekshayev, nurses Olga Neklibova and Olga Doronkina, Keksenia Karina, cook Ivan Piatakov took off their overcoats, wet them with water and threw them over the barrels. The rate of firing does not decrease. Mountains illuminated by the first rays of the rising sun. From the command post heard the calm voice Karchenko. Good. Guns. Shot. Everyone take cover. Observers take their places. Steam locomotives. Full back. Fascist planes are diving over the hollow from where the armored train has just fired. It's already far away. One more turn and we're in the tunnel. The next combat assignment. To provide assistance by fire to the artillerymen of the famous 30th battery of Captain Alexander. It daily shelled enemy positions and rear areas, but in these days was surrounded. It was necessary at all costs to disperse the enemy units that surrounded the battery. In fulfillment of this task took part in Shelesnya Kopsi. The fascists were thrown back, and again the battery men were destroying the enemy's manpower and equipment by the fire of their heavy guns. However, after three months of heavy fire, most of the gun barrels needed to be replaced. How to do it? Fleet Commander Admiral F.E.S. Okiabuski arrived at the railroad junction, and asked the track workers to deliver the barrels to the battery. To perform this task, I, D. Kislev A. E. Mimkov, and other railroad commanders appointed strong, strong willed people. The group included and the men of the railway company of Captain Selevistov, which served our armored train. It was possible to get to the 30th battery from the station Mackenzie V. Gori, from which a special railroad branch line ran along the valley. At that time, the valley was the front edge of our defense. On the opposite slope, the fascists were located. The head of the track distance, Mikhail Nikolaevich Felsky, together with the road foreman Nikitin Kizlev and Nemkov, were instructed to go to the place to check the condition of the track in order to make repairs if necessary. For two nights, the men of the railroad company completely restored the branch. So with the head of the steam locomotive part, Pavel Mikhailovich Leschenko, picked up the best locomotive and supplied it with good coal so that all the time it was possible to have the right amount of steam. Experienced drivers Kalashnikov and Ivlev were entrusted to drive the locomotive. All day long they prepared the steam locomotive BV-350 for the voyage. By evening in the southern bay the gun barrels were loaded on a four-axle platform. Our armoured train was to stand ready, and in case of need to divert the fire of fascist batteries on itself. When everything was ready for departure, 
The commandant of Sevastopol Station, Captain Luzev, gave Ivlevu City and field passes. The captain himself sat down on the platform, where there were several sailors' battery maidens. Nearby settled Velsky and Nikitin, with a group of repair workers. The train moved off and soon disappeared around the corner. It was a frosty night. We were on the armoured platforms. Time dragged languidly. Finally the phone rang. The call came from Mackenzie V. Gori Stim. I'm Sheglov. Special transport accepted. Everything is in order. From the station Mackenzie V. Gori Ivlev and Kalashnikov carefully led the train down the slope. They loaded the furnace with such a calculation so as not to open it in the area of the leading edge. The train passed through the valley unnoticed and disappeared behind the hill. Here it was met by the batteries of the 30. They had already been informed over the field wire that the railroaders were coming to the rescue, bringing them a present. The battery commander, Captain Alexander, came to the stopped locomotive. Red Fleet men came running after him. Noiselessly they unhitched the locomotive and left it at the excavation, and the platform was manually rolled up to the battery. Not an hour later, the platform was again lowered to the locomotive. On the armoured train anxiously awaited the return of the railroaders. It was already three o'clock in the morning. The telephone bell rang. Everyone jumped up and became alert. The commander picked up the phone. Chikaglov. I hear the noise of an approaching locomotive. The armoured train was connected to the line on which all reports went to the railway command post. Finally the train passed us. At 4.30 it arrived at the Sevastopol station. The first trip was a success. In the following nights the drivers Kalashnikov and Ivlev together with railroad workers made three more such heroic flights. The last time the fascists still noticed that a train was running along the railroad track at night. They started shelling the road and damaged a part of the railroad track. But then Zelezniakov came into action. The fascists transferred the fire to him. Meanwhile, the railroad workers adjusted the line, and the train with gun barrels again moved forward. Platforms and the front of the locomotive had already passed the dangerous place, and the last tender pair went off the rails. It was necessary to stop at the most dangerous place. And while the Zelezniakovites were engaged in a duel with the fascist artillery, the steam locomotives and trackmen together with the commanders of the 30 freed themselves from the tender and went to a safe zone. The help to the battery men came in time. On the night of December 28-29, after heavy fighting in the area of Mackenzie of Mountains, the armoured train returned to Inkerman. Here we were to be replenished with ammunition, coal and water. The crew was given a risk. The armoured train was put on the second track under the rock at the adit of the Champagne factory. Our usual parking lot was in the city tunnel. It was safer there. But we were too tired of the tunnel, cramped and damp. I wanted to spend at least one night in the air. All the days of the second fascist attack on Sevastopol Zelezniakovsi almost did not leave the armour. It was cold on the armoured platforms. The casemates were not heated. We were all pretty hot. And now everyone was glad to spend a few hours in human conditions. From the city tunnel to the armoured train were brought residential cars. Put them between the armoured platforms and the rock to protect from shrapnel, if the enemy starts shelling. The commander ordered the crew members who were free from duty to rest, so the sailors gladly climbed into soft, clean beds. And restless Lieutenant Zorin, as if he was not tired at all, turned to Koshenko. See, comrade commander, allow me to go to the front line with the guys. Let's ask for a search with the army men. The commander moved his eyebrows sternly, but his eyes smiled. No, comrade Zorin, he answered as sternly as possible, and he added more gently, You are a restless soul, I know it, but you won't go anywhere today. Go and get some hot water from the locomotive, wash yourself properly, shave and get some sleep. Boris tried to object, but the commander was supported by the commissar. Sleep, Boris. While we're busy with refueling and repairs, you rest, and don't talk back. If the commander says so, that... Well, sleep it off, you sighed the lieutenant. The attention of the commander and commissar, of course, he was touched, but the heart of the scout still could not calm down. I, too, went to the Teplushka. In the carriage, his hot heated. For the first time in weeks, people washed, changed their linen, had a good dinner and fell into a sound, peaceful sleep. At three o'clock in the morning, there was a strong explosion. The carriage shook, another explosion, another. The sailors jumped up, grabbed their clothes and, dressing on the move, rushed to the armoured platforms to their battle stations. Waking up from the rumble, 
I did not immediately realize where I was. There was hustle and bustle and running around. But when my consciousness came back on, I realized that the fascists had started shelling. Could it be that the German adjuster had detected the armored train? Not remembering himself, I rushed out of the car. Jumping over funnels, sleepers, posts, I ran together with everyone. Even from afar we heard the voice of the chief of the guard. It got into the commissariat car. They're already huddled in the darkness, Red Fleet men. The commissar went up to the vestibule and shone a hand flashlight. I'm going with him. The shell hit the outermost compartment. Here slept Lieutenant Zorin, Petty Officer Senior Enlisted Man Beremtsev and Midshipman Zerenadsky. All three were killed. From the neighboring compartments came Koshetov, Mayorov, Butsenko, Molshak. Our girls are here too. They had not yet come to their senses after what had happened. Olya looked at others with wide open, frightened eyes. She had seen a lot of blood, but she had never seen such a close, ridiculous death. For a long time we stood in mournful silence near our dead comrades. We could not believe that Boris Zorin, fearless scout, clever and funny man, had left us forever. How many times he had to be in reconnaissance, under fire, with his guys he searched the whole front line. Not a single bullet hit him there, and here in the rear, here you are. Three days ago, Boris turned twenty years old. His comrades congratulated him, predicted a hundred years of life, Uncle Misha Silin, in honor of such a celebration, baked a large cake and gave it to the birthday boy. Our carelessness cost us dearly. It was a bitter lesson. After this incident, we never rested in the open. The dead were buried not far from the entrance to the Trinity Tunnel. There were speeches, a farewell salute. And then the armored train rushed to the enemy positions. Crushing with crushing volleys on the enemy, the Zelezniakovsi paid the last honors to their comrades in arms, avenged their deaths. Stevels near Sevastopol took more and more fierce character. Hitlerites did not count with losses, striving at any cost to fulfill the order of their mad Fuhrer and to seize the Black Sea stronghold. At the station de Vanquay, one after another came German echelons with soldiers, artillery and tanks. And newly arrived conquerors, stupefied by propaganda and schnapps, rushed into battle. Our scouts found in the dead soldiers and officers boastful letters and telegrams which they were going to send home to Germany. We have come quite close to Sevastopol. Already we can see its houses. By nightfall we will be in the city, wrote one. Saw Sevastopol through binoculars. Tomorrow, on New Year's Eve, we will be there, boasted another. Don't shake your head until you jump over it, said the Zelezny Kovit in response to such letters. Sarah Armoured Train in these days acted on a site of 345th Rifle Division. It was one of the decisive areas of defense. The division had to hold the Mackenzieff Mountains by all means. If the Nazis managed to break through the division's positions and reach the northern bay, the fall of Sevastopol would be inevitable. This was perfectly understood by the enemy command. At dawn on December 31, the enemy rained fire of hundreds of guns and mortars on the division. After that, the attack began. I at that time could not, of course, see the whole picture of the battle, and to give an idea of the situation on the Mackenzieff Mountains, I will use the memories of the Chief of Staff of the 345th Infantry Division, Literally an avalanche of shells and mines, large and small caliber, came upon us, loosening the ground, mixing black soil with snow. Positions were soon covered with craters, trenches leveled with the ground, everything flew into the air. Stones, stakes of wire fences, broken weapons, wagons, wagons. At eight, ten o'clock in the morning, the enemy went on the attack along the whole front. In front went tanks, behind them, thousands of Hitlerites. Our artillery put a veil and barrage, separating the tanks from the infantry. In many points tanks exploded on minefields and were hit by the guns of Lieutenant Colonel Vedenive's unit, but several dozens of machines broke through and began to irrigate our positions. The German infantry broke into the trenches. In the battle we introduced battalion, and in two regiments and regimental reserves, but they did not restore the position. In the center, at the junction of the two regiments, formed a deep breach, the defense collapsed and filed back. In this, one of the most difficult moments of the memorable day, we were strongly supported by artillery. In the direction of Mackenzie v. Gori station, the last reserve of the division was introduced. An armored train with sailors came out of the tunnel and hit the enemy and the guns of the Black Sea fleet ships opened a devastating fire on the artillery and fresh enemy columns. So powerful sounded this massive blow, 
so pleased with the clarity of interaction that we all cheered up. There was no time, but we all felt. Here it is that cherished break in the battle, after which there will be a lot of labour and blood, but still it is clear that the enemy is in difficulty, and any experienced fighter understands it perfectly. From the armoured train we saw only a small section of the front, but it was just that section where our infantrymen were retreating under the onslaught of the numerically superior enemy. Hitlerites, heated up by the battle, were marching along the railroad bed at full height, and their thick chains turned out to be a good target for our machine gunners and artillerymen. Tenly soldiers and officers scattered in search of shelter, and then rushed away from the railroad, leaving dozens of dead and wounded in the snow. Encouraged by the strong support of the armoured train, our infantrymen went into a counter-attack and pushed back the Germans to their original positions. After eleven o'clock Hitlerites, under the cover of a smokescreen, again rose to the attack. It lasted about an hour, and again in the most decisive moment of the battle, armoured train Zelizniakov rushed at the enemy. How hated this armoured train Germans, and how many kind, full of gratitude words were said in his address by our soldiers and commanders, wrote later Colonel I. F. Hummers. Sailors worked on the armoured train. The courage of the Black Sea sailors has long entered the proverbs. The armoured train really raided the enemy and fired with such a rapid unexpectedness, as if it was running not on the rails, but directly on the uneven ground of the peninsula. Just on this last day of 1941, Hitler writes, not only failed to advance in the direction of the north side, but also had to be thoroughly displaced. Having repulsed the attacks, the 345th Infantry Division went on the offensive and pushed back the enemy behind the Belbeck Valley. In the evening of December 31st, the armoured train moved into the Troitsky Tunnel, and the first news we heard here was about the landing of Soviet troops in Kerch and Feodesia. We read with admiration the report about the courage of the sailors of the cruiser Krasny Kavkaz, which, having broken through the barrier chains, broke into Feridosia Bay and opened the way for landing ships with the fire of its mighty artillery. This was the best help to the defenders of Sevastopol. The Nazis were taken by surprise. To fight the landing they had to transfer troops to the eastern coast of the peninsula and temporarily stop the assault on the main base of the fleet. A small respite received and the crew of the armoured train. The command decided to organise a New Year's Eve party with a festive dinner for the personnel. All cleaned themselves up, cleaned and dressed up. Arkady Kamornik was dressed up as Santa Claus. The girls decorated a Christmas tree saved for the occasion by a petty officer of the Commandant's group Vanya Gureyev. The commander and the commissar came and congratulated the sailors on the new year. The commissar raised a toast for our coming victory, remembered the wounded in the hospital, in deep silence honoured the memory of the dead. Radio operators meanwhile set up a loudspeaker. Without ten minutes to twelve sounded the voice of Mikhail Ivanovich Kalinin. Zelizniakovites listened in solemn silence to the New Year speech of the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. Our combat friends, Marines army men with whom we fight shoulder to shoulder on the Sevastopol land, also came to congratulate us. We parted far past midnight. Coming out of the tunnel we breathed in a full chest of fresh frosty air, which we often lacked in the casemates. In the distance we could see flashes of light, from there came the whir of guns, machine guns were clearly tapping out short bursts. We had long since gotten used to it. But here to the rolling echo of the cannonade another sound is added, a nasty, howling worm. And at once blue tentacles of searchlight soared upward. In the high beam, resting in the blackness of the sky, a small dot flashes brightly like a firefly in the night, and all the tentacles instantly reach out to it, crossing in a tight knot. And somewhere in the sky there is the steady hum of our hawks. They are not visible, but they are inexorably approaching the point illuminated by the rays. Another minute, two minutes, and near the bundle of tentacles a scattering of multicolored dots flashes. The lines of tracer bullets are repeated again and again, and then the bright point in the crosshairs bursts into flame and falls into the abyss of night. But the rays shudder and fall, crossing again and again on the burning torch, and so they see it off to the ground. A powerful explosion shakes the surroundings and then everything goes quiet again. The beams of searchlights lazily wander the sky for a few more seconds, but there is nothing there anymore, and they go out, giving way to the frosty darkness. I don't feel like going to sleep. We wander along the railroad track and silently think about each of us. However, hardly anyone has thoughts that are not connected with the fate of the city, which we defend with the fate of relatives and friends whom the war scattered over a vast territory.
with the fate of our vast country. The sky is gradually beginning to pinken, and now the dawn is already more and more imperiously declares itself. The morning has come, the morning of the new year 1942. During the day we replenished ammunition, refueled the locomotives, and at night we went on another trip. The armoured train went silently. The drivers were driving the train in such a way that not even a light knock was heard. Not a single spark flew out of the pipes of steam locomotives, and the light blue smoke was dissipating, merging with the low-hanging snow clouds. We were about to approach the intended position unnoticed, but the sudden attack did not take place. It remained to pass some five hundred metres, as suddenly ahead the searchlight flashed dazzlingly and immediately found the armoured train. At the same minute Hitlerites opened fire. Shots rumbled, lumps of frozen earth, stones, splinters flew up around. They hit the sides, rumbling, falling on the decks of armoured platforms whistling in the air. We had to return fire. The night duel between the armoured train and the enemy battery began. An enemy shell exploded at one of the guns. Ilya Yusets and Mikhail Novitsky fell, hit by shrapnel. The wounded were immediately taken to the Kasimot. Vasily Bondarev Lavrenti Fesun and Vasily Sir Khan replaced those out of action. The gun continued to fire. From the close explosion of the shell, the recoiler was out of order, the barrel was rolled manually. And again a direct hit in the sight. There was a deafening explosion. Flames burst out and engulfed the charges lying on the deck. Then Ivan Myashin, Yasha Baklan and Lavrenti Fisson rushed to the place of fire, scalding and gasping from smoke. They threw the burning charges overboard, transferred them to a safe place not yet engulfed in flames. The explosion of ammunition was prevented, which is the first combat operation of Zelezniakov in the new year ended in failure. The commander ordered to withdraw. Continuing to shoot back, the armoured train moved on the way back. Each of us felt guilty of failure although we all realize that military happiness is changeable and not every battle can be victorious. But in the morning we managed to take revenge. Turning from the voyage, we stopped at the Sevastopol State District power plant, where there was still a refueling site with a water dispenser. Just started refueling, as the observers report that air. Fleet fascist airplanes came out from behind the mountain. The commander, Kamisa, and I were at that time in the side, at the old barrack. The fascists dropped bombs, fired on the armoured train from machine guns and cannons. The blast wave knocked us down. We jump up, look at the armoured train. No direct hits, but the bombs exploded very close. The curly heads of the explosions had not yet had time to disperse, and the planes were coming in again. The anti-aircraft group prepared to open fire. Among anti-aircraft gunners, Dojikia, Krivobokov and Baranov as if on the exercises, calmly and businesslike, they command their calculations. One of the planes goes into a dive. Fire, commands Zhikiao. But the Hitler pilot ahead of anti-aircraft gunners, on the armor deafeningly rattled enemy bullets, the gunner Red Fleet Sharapkin grabbed his shoulder and released the machine gun. His place was taken by the commander of the calculation. We see how spider webs of traces stretched to the bomber coming out of the dive. This vulture managed to get away. But immediately from somewhere from the side appeared a second Messerschmitt, and very conveniently, a line of tracer bullets slammed into it, like a funeral ribbon, a black band of smoke stretched behind it, and so he flew down the slope until he crashed into the grey surface of the northern bay. Hurrah! shouted the sailors. De Shikia was laughing in joyous delight. Oh, come on, Janet's veil, next. Sests, as if obeyed him, make a second run. And again the bullets sent by our guys rush into the head plane. A moment, and the plane bursts into flames like absorbent cotton soaked in gasoline. Tailed comet falls into the water in the same place as the first. And again a thunderous sailor's hurrah shakes the air. The other six airplanes, having gained altitude, disappeared behind the mountain. We stand excited. This doesn't happen often. We rush to the armoured platform, pulling from it machine gunners, tossed into the air. Nurse came here, Karina bandaging Sharapkin, shout. No, careful. First you would have looked, maybe someone else was hit. It's we, with a serious look, groping heroes. No, intact. The commander rejoices with everyone, but he orders to give the moorings, although the refueling of the locomotives is not over yet. To shoot down planes, of course, is good, but there is no need to risk the armoured train. Quickly fixed the broken arrow and took cover in the Troitsky Tunnel. The commander called to himself Dishikia, Baranov and Krivoboka.
I thank you for your success and bravery, he said, shaking hands with the petty officers. You will be presented to the award. The boys are walking birthday boys. Their portraits are placed in the newly issued combat sheet. When I brought it to the commissar for review, he had agitators. The commissaire instructed them how to conduct conversations about the exploits of anti-aircraft gunners. The rest of the day, everyone was under the impression of the battle. Only a small strip of land separated the fascists from the north side, and they again and again made attempts to break through to Sukarnaya Gully at Mackenzie of Cordon. Heavy fighting ensued. The front was getting closer. Through the rumble of gun salvos, machine gun crackling was clearly heard. It seemed that the fighting was going on the very outskirts of the city. At the most tense moment, the armoured train went to the strait, and a point-blank range struck with all firepower, rendering assistance to Potapov's brigade. We again faced the enemy at the memorable Mackenzie Mountains, our naval and army units, skillfully interacting, forced the fascists to flee. The enemy was again knocked out. The former position of the front was restored. In this battle, the personnel of the armoured train especially distinguished themselves. The rate of fire was such that the paint was burning on the guns, and the machine gun housings were boiling water. Exceptionally well coordinated commanders of armoured platoon Kuchetov and Butsenko. After the death of Zorin, intelligence led Molchanov and Mayorov, inseparable friends. They every day bring valuable information about the enemy. Gun commanders Boyko Danilish, Drozdov Luchenko, Lodomaya Sheen, Gun number Zakhar Luchenko, Commanders Fison and Grishko, Machine Gunners Efim Chumichev, Makarenko Sharapkin, Baranov and Krivobakov acquired full In any conditions they work proactively and without fuss. All of them are set as an example to other soldiers. As before, a great help to us railroaders. Company of Senior Lieutenant Selivostov accompanies us in almost all trips. When an enemy shell destroys the track, the repairmen are already on the spot. Quickly, without fuss, they fill in the craters, put sleepers, install rails, patch the canvas. Dozens of minutes pass, and the line is ready. Zelezniakov again goes on a voyage. Often the company has to work under fire. January 14, when the repairmen were working near Mackenzie V. Hills, they were spotted by a Nazi mortar battery. Mines began to fall around. The soldiers lay down in ditches, some of them hid behind the embankment. When everything quieted down, everyone came out of their hiding places and started to work again. A few minutes later the fire resumed. It was repeated three times, and time was running out. And then the fighters decided to work without paying attention to the explosions. The work was coming to an end. The last rail was already sued to the sleepers, as suddenly a mine fell very near. The sledgehammer fell out of Georgi Gontaruk's hands, Rakimov fell, hit by a shrapnel, and many were wounded but the repair was finished in time. After picking up the killed and wounded, the railroaders quickly left behind the rock. There they buried their comrades, paying the last honours to the dead with a gun salute. Always, in any conditions, the soldiers of Senior Lieutenant Selivostov provided the armoured train Green Street in the direction of Mackenzie of Mountains. In addition to Selivostov, in the company were other courageous, brave commanders. Maslenikov Dunsky, who graduated before the war at the Transport Institute, the commander of the platoon of bombers Philip. They were always together with the soldiers, shared with them all the difficulties and dangers. Company foreman Pavlov proved himself to be a fearless warrior. Pavlov spoke well of Alexei Filipov, with whom I met during the repair of the Balaclava branch. I knew the commander of the railroad battalion Goncharov, Commissar Shumilin. Both of them enjoyed great authority among their soldiers. A lot of help gave us and the workers of the marine plant, especially remembered artillery master Ivan Petrovich Kozlov, an old worker, a Bolshevik with pre-revolutionary experience, a veteran of the Civil War. He refused to evacuate from Sevastopol and on his own will came to us on the armoured train. All soldiers without exception respect him. They call him Pater. Ivan Petrovich knows all kinds and types of artillery installations. True, like all elderly people, he is a little grumpy, likes to scold young people for the wind in his head. But the sailors realize that the old man is attached to them with all his heart and sees his son in everyone. In the heaviest battles he does not leave the open areas, always ready to help if the cannon fails. Ivan Petrovich does not part with a weighty canvas bag, where nuts, bolts, screws, Cotter pins are always rattling. On the other shoulder hangs a bunch of different sized gears. The sailors joke loving.
You, Ivan Petrovich, are a walking workshop. What can you do? Smiles the old man. Without this spring your cannon won't fire. And where will you get such a piece of iron if I don't have it? That's just it. Our cannons were shabby, worn out, but thanks to Ivan Petrovich's efforts they never failed and worked properly. Once in battle the gunner Makarenko was wounded. Where did the old man's strength come from? He replaced a big sailor. So until the end and brought heavy shells. How many times there were delays and breakdowns in the battle, and always at such a moment Ivan Petrovich was at the gun. No, keep firing. He nodded to the gunners, having eliminated the malfunction, and hurried to another gun. Iwan Drovich had no one could make him wear a helmet. When they told him about the precaution, the old man joked, Don't be afraid for me. No bomb can touch someone like me. He was an amazingly fearless man. Why are you chasing me into hiding? I have no time for hiding, he grumbled when he was sent to the casemate. One day Ivan Petrovich was called in by the artilleryman of a battery standing on the northern side. One of the guns had to have its barrel replaced, and the second gun was moping, so the old man went. Enemy airplanes were circling in the sky. Ivan Petrovich did not hide. He knew that they were waiting for him at the battery. Fascist pilots noticed him and opened machine gun fire from a shaving flight. Ivan Petrovich fell down. Four bullets dug into his chest, there near the battery, and buried him. Shelezniakovsky grieved terribly, having learned about Ivrich's death. We could not successfully fight if we were not helped by dozens, hundreds of people like Ivan Petrovich, people who were not military, but whose courage was envied by each of us. In any case, we felt the support and care of hundreds of our friends from Sevastopol Railroad Junction. Railroad girls, having changed from duty in a depot or at a station, turned into orderlies and went to the hospital. Housewife Anastasia Petrovna Polterikina and Komsomol girl Anya Chadovich organized a brigade of workers and wives of railwaymen, which washed linen for soldiers. From Sevastopol railroad workers consisted and steam locomotive brigades. Steam locomotive of Mikhail Galanin had no armor and we were always worried for our comrades. It was enough for a stray piece of shrapnel to hit the steam boiler so that the locomotive flew into the air. But our machinists calmly did their job. From the Shavrov's hollow, the armored train was hitting the enemy's front line with direct fire. The enemy detected it and returned fire. The airplanes buzzed in the air. Shooting back, the armored train began to withdraw to the gypsy tunnel. Just after the turn from the station Mackenzie v. Gori, as suddenly a heavy shell exploded ahead. The explosion dislodged a whole link of rails. The drivers pressed the brake levers to failure. From the sharp braking everyone fell off their feet. The braked wheels were screeching, squealing, and the train continued to creep forward by inertia. The first ballast platform fell into the funnel, the second one was piled on it, and then both of them went under the slope. The armored platform to which they were attached also went off the rails, but miraculously kept on the embankment. On the unarmed steam locomotive the chimney burst from the concussion. A high column of steam rose above the locomotive. The steam locomotive went out of service. Noticing that the armoured train stopped, Hitlerites intensified shelling, so that the shells fell more and more heaps. There was a deadly threat. We must leave immediately, but how? It is necessary to restore the track, to raise the armoured platform on rails, to load spare parts from the fallen platforms. Another shell destroyed the railroad bed behind the armoured train. Another hit the tail ballast platform. We had no way either forward to the tunnel or backward, where we could take shelter in the excavation for some time. There was only one way, and to restore the track as quickly as possible. So the commander of the armoured train ordered to leave the reduced calculations at the battle stations, and all the others to be sent to the disposal of Lieutenant Golovenko and the commander of the railway platoon, Junior Lieutenant Andrev. Despite the artillery fire, the Red Fleet men went to work in a friendly manner. In a few minutes new rails were laid and securely sewn to the sleepers. Spare parts from the fallen platforms were lifted and loaded onto the armoured platforms. But how to lift a multi-ton armoured platform that had fallen off the rails? It required a powerful steam locomotive. We have only a small, armoured shunting sheep left in service and the second steam locomotive is standing with its furnace extinguished. That's when our Evgeny Matyosh, a modest and quiet assistant driver, showed himself. It is possible to shut off the tube for a while and then in the tunnel to cool down the furnace and make a more thorough repair. 
he suggested. And that for this purpose it is necessary to get into the furnace, you, said the driver, and now it is all three hundred degrees, if not more. There is only one way out, to drain the steam. You can't do that, Xenia stubbornly objected. Let me go into the furnace and shut off the pipe. You'll burst into flames like a candle, and in the best case you'll boil like a cancer, refused the commander of the armoured train. And you will help me, Zinya continued to insist. You will water me with a hose so that I don't get fried. Sailor Grebenichenko climbed into the hot furnace of the cruiser. You told me about it yourself. The boilers there are much bigger and more dangerous than those of a steam engine. We have to save the armoured train. The planes will come again. Nothing will happen to me. Zhenya asked and proved so much that the commander agreed, especially since the enemy artillery kept firing and shells were bursting from all sides. It was necessary to withdraw the armoured train to a safe place in a hurry. Matyush pulled out of the pocket of Overall's Komsomol ticket, photo cards and handed to Lieutenant Golovin. Zhenya was put into felt boots, put on a cotton jacket and canvas pants, wrapped in a raincoat. His face was covered with gauze folded several times. A hat was put on, and he was poured water from a hose from head to toe. Shinist Polyakov with a hose stood at the furnace. With the help of his comrades, Zhenya squeezed himself into the dark hole that was blazing hot. Another machinist Galanin gave him the necessary tools and a plug. Golovenko directed the beam of a strong hand lamp into the furnace. From time to time Polyakov poured cold water on the daredevil. When the water hit the walls of the furnace, it hissed. Puffs of steam burst out of the black yawn. From the depths of the boiler came muffled blows. The drivers heard nothing but these sounds, though near the locomotive there were rumbling explosions, which made the steam locomotive shudder and shake, as if it were a living thing. All with intense attention, holding their breath, followed the actions of Zania. And it was difficult for him. He was panting, his face and hands stung intolerably, and tears covered his eyes. But he, gathering all his strength and will, continued to work. Finally, from the depths of the furnace came a faint voice. Pull out. Zhenya was quickly snatched out of the furnace. He had the strength to say only one word, done, and he lost consciousness. The sailors carried the hero out of the locomotive box in their arms and handed him over to the doctor. It was no longer difficult to drive in another plug from the side of the smoke box. Soon the firebox was humming. The steam locomotive was on the move again and in a few minutes the armoured platform was raised on the rails. The fortress on wheels had come out of the shelling. In the gypsy tunnel the commander ordered the crew to line up, thanked everyone, and especially Zhenya Matyosh. He promised to present all those who had distinguished themselves for awards. And that day we solved Zhenya's hidden secret. His girlfriend's card was in our hands for just a minute, but in the smiling girl we all immediately recognised the Komsomol girl, Anya Chadovich the initiator of many patriotic deeds at the railway junction. Tienya and Anya were wounded almost simultaneously. He at the front, she in Sevastopol, when together with her friends she was carrying firewood for the laundry. Even Mayachin and Olya Doronkina had a strong friendship. It was not uncommon for the sailors to make jokes, tell jokes and generally use all sorts of ambiguous words. The girls did not like the swagger of the boys. Olya often conscientized them. She had noticed that Mayashin was offended by such words. Ivan was a cultured, intelligent man, behaved very correctly. Maybe that was the reason why Olia somehow became close to him, attached to him like a sister. During the battle she did not leave his gun, helped him, worried about his life. And when the battle was over she would tidy up his clothes, smear iodine on his hands, she took care of the guy, and that and did not suspect that he harboured to her not only friendly feelings, Olya often asked to give her a real combat mission, to send her on a reconnaissance mission. For a long time she refused, but one day the commander said, Okay, go ahead, but be careful, and obey the lieutenant in everything. Six of us wheat and at Molchanov, Kamornik Andreev, Sir Shan, me and Olya Doronkina. We went stealthily, made a reconnaissance safely, mapped three enemy firing points. But when we were returning, the enemy found us and opened heavy machine gun fire. A bullet hit Molkanov's shoulder. That's where Oli's skill was needed. She quickly and skillfully bandaged the wound, tightly swaddled his arm, tying it to his torso. We reached the adjustment point, and while Lieutenant Molkanov was calling the fire of the armored train, we went into the dugout to the infantrymen and talked. Suddenly, Olya, looking intently into the corner where a fighter was sitting, 
shout, Hmm, Kolya, are you? Satilja raised his head, and immediately his eyes widened with surprise and joy. Oh yeah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here on the front line? What can one do on the front line? I'm fighting like everyone else. So they hugged and kissed. That's how Olya met her cousin at the front. Immediately they were surrounded by soldiers, rejoicing at such an unexpected meeting. Meanwhile, the cannons of the armored train, without a murmur, were beating on the enemy's front line. Lieutenant Molchanov, despite the wound, adjusted the fire accurately, without error. Two bunkers were destroyed before our eyes. Already in the evening, we approached the parking lot of the armored train. Olya held up well. She not only showed no signs of fatigue, but also tried to support the wounded lieutenant. A kilometer and a half from the parking lot, they met my machine. He was alarmed, but when he saw that Olga was alive and unharmed, he calmed down, and only now the girl realized how dear she was to this modest, taciturn guy. Taking advantage of the temporary lull, Zelezniakovsi renewed the camouflage of the armored train, repaired the armored train, locomotives, and the Dresdner. We replaced some barrels of the main caliber, installed new regimental mortars, put the guns in order. A great help was rendered to us by a sapper battalion attached to us. The sappers cleared all tunnel entrances, repaired the damaged railroad bed. In the Troitskat tunnel an ammunition depot was set up. Chain, the armored train had already accumulated considerable experience in combat operations. Various methods of artillery fire were developed, both from closed positions and direct fire. Seekouts located convenient landmarks, made marks on the rails. When the armored train stood on them, you could immediately, without shooting, open a rapid fire. Such surprise raids were the most effective. We were still operating on the Mackenzievsky direction, in the area of Belbek Valley and Shavrovaya Notch. There were the most favorable conditions for the armored train. Railway tunnels well camouflaged it, and most importantly, it was in these areas the enemy was very active. Tree, the commander of the seaside army, ordered the Zelezniakovsi to go out for a fire attack on the enemy in the area of the Kamishlovsky Bridge. The division commander, Colonel Laskin, reported that large enemy forces were concentrated in the Velbeck Valley. New firing points were being set up, giving no rest to our unit. Previously, the armored train fired at enemy positions from the Shavrovaya Notch, several kilometers from the bridge. This did not have the proper effect as not all our firepower could participate in the firing, we could not get into an open position, most of the track was destroyed. As the Marines reported, the Kamishlovsky bridge was also damaged. It was urgent to find out the situation, check all the ways and approaches to the bridge. The reconnaissance was led by the commander. A dozen and a half of Zelezniakov's men participated in the sortie. I was having taken everything we needed, we set off on an armored train. We managed to slip unnoticed through Inkerman Valley, shot by fascists and go to Mackenzie v. Gori Peninsula. Here we were joined by a group of army artillery reconnaissance. T. The commander of the armored train contacted Potapov's headquarters by telephone to find out the extent of damage to the Kemishlovsky Bridge. There were several direct shell hits. The Marines reported this was still nothing, and we were to inspect the bridge with our own forces. The Potapovs had assigned their reconnaissance platoon to help us. Having passed the combat guard of our troops, we lurked about 300 meters from the bridge and began to observe, but from here the necessary data could not be obtained. Then the detachment decided to approach the bridge with great caution. We went out into the open, lay down. Such marvelous beauty opened before us that, for a moment everyone forgot about the danger, admiring the majestically austere winter landscape. The Belbeck Valley was spreading ahead in all its pristine beauty. Hey, how beautiful! whispered Vanya Gariv, our new commander of the reconnaissance. My soul hurts for this ruined beauty. I look at the snow-covered mountains and remember hunting in the north in the tundra. Mutting is more difficult here. Natch, Harkanko replied, but as for beauty, it is really beautiful here. I used to gather nuts and dogwoods in these places when I was a child. When the war is over, I will definitely stay in Sevastopol, said Vanya Gariv firmly, talking in a half-whisper. We keep watch for a long time, and it seems that ahead no danger. I want to stand up to my full height, take a full chest of fragrant frosty air, and sing with all the power of my young lungs. Suddenly a shot rang out. Ah, hey, one enemy battery has found itself. It was immediately pinged. The commander laughed. Lieutenant Koshitov has a job to do. 
and everything froze again. But not for long. A few minutes later, another battery gave itself away. Then another and another. We looked through binoculars all the area adjacent to the bridge. The booth on the right side of the bridge remained suspicious. After waiting a bit, we split into two groups. Gadyuchenko, Girev, and a few army men went to the right of the height, jet with three scouts. The commander ordered me to go through the bridge, survey it, then go into the valley on the other side and, having scouted it, leave an observer there to adjust the fire of the armored train. Jayev's group was to cover our withdrawal. Only we were about to move on the way, as a scout appeared in the air. Smoothly, like a kite, he flew over us and disappeared behind the heights. Again a few shots rang out, apparently. The fascists were firing on the scout's data. And these firing points were on Kark and Co.'s map. We did not move very far. We were pinned to the ground by mortar fire. The Germans noticed us. So they are very close. From the booth at the bridge suddenly rumbled machine gun. It was joined by machine guns. We lay down, but we were in a very disadvantageous position. The place was flat and quite open. So the firing did not stop for a second, and we could not even raise our heads. The bullets squealed into the ground, kicking up a dusting of snow around us. Not far away mines were burned. One of the scouts grabbed his arm. The sleeve of his coat above the elbow was immediately soaked with blood. Another scout was wounded. It was necessary to withdraw immediately. But how to get up? I took out a grenade and threw it as hard as I could in the direction of the Germans. The group began to retreat by short runs. Soon everyone lay down in a small hollow. It was safer here. But there were still a hundred meters to the height, behind which it was possible to hide. The fascists, seeing that the scouts were in a dangerous position, opened even more active fire. We, shooting on the move, joined the main group and continued to retreat by short runs. Finally, a deep hollow opened up in front of us, leading to our front lines. We were saved. But the joy was short-lived. The gully turned out to be mined. Why didn't the Potapovs tell us about it? How could they have known we'd end up in this place? We hadn't gone a dozen meters when a strong explosion sounded. The commander of the army scouts, the captain who was ahead of us, was blown up on a mine. I rushed to the captain. He was still alive. Having taken him on my back, I started to descend. Karchenko was carrying a weapon, and on the way was keeping an eye on him. Shooting suddenly stopped. Apparently, the fascists decided that they had already dealt with us. But in what position is the other group? After a little waiting, we began to sneak to the place of the agreed meeting. Our comrades were already there. Two fighters ran up to me and carefully removed the captain. He was dead. Gadyukenko was wounded in the head. When I threw a grenade, Gereyev took advantage of a slight hiccup and dragged his comrade to cover and bandaged him. Carefully carrying the wounded and killed, we returned to the train. The reconnaissance data was extensive, although it came at a high price. The commander of the reconnaissance was buried at the gypsy tunnel. Jedukenko and I, with Koshitov and two machine gunners, as even Shaposhnikov, accompanied him to the hospital. Despite the fact that the hospital was deep underground, it had plenty of light. Electric engines produced as much power as was needed. Having determined Gadyushenko, we were returning by a low corridor. At one of the underground wards we saw a few medical personnel looking inside the ward with curiosity. Kochitov and I looked in too. At the very entrance stood two officers in navy uniforms. We saw only their backs. They were holding some kind of machines. They are making a movie, a young sister explained to us. They are filming Anke the machine gun. So the cameramen parted, and we saw in the back of the ward a very young girl. In bed she seemed almost a teenager. It was Nina Onilova, the legendary machine gunner of the 25th Chapiev Division, nicknamed for her courage, bravery and skill anchor the machine gunner. She was lying propped up on a high pillow and smiled her beautiful smile, familiar from newspaper photographs to all the defenders of Sevastopol. She was wearing a white uniform, which seemed blindingly snowy here and on her chest burned brightly. The new order of the Red Banner and in this military outfit she was beautiful not only with her girlish beauty, but with the beauty of a fighter, with her courage, with some unusual spirituality. The cameramen came to shoot her, and there was another man with a notebook and a pen, probably a journalist. Hmm, what are you thinking about now, Nina? he asks. Her gaze grows sterner, her smile fades from her face. After a little silence, she says, I'm lying here now, in the room is so quiet and I have before my eyes the trenches, the war, my comrades. 
and in my ears all the time there is a rumble and machine guns cracking and mines rustling, and I dream about the battle every night. The correspondent writes and writes, apparently. He really wants many people to know what this Sevastopol heroine thinks about, what helps her to fight. Nothing to Zeshin. How are you able to bear such a thing? Nina smiles again. From the looks of it I am small weak, but I will tell you the truth. My hand never once trembled. It's inconvenient, they say. We've had a look and that's enough. We leave with some unusual lightness in our hearts, deeply excited by what we have seen. We are even more convinced that Sevastopol will never kneel before any aliens. How could such people be defeated? When we returned to the armoured train, the railroad platoon under Pavel Andreev had already restored a large section of track. At night, Zelezniakov approached the Kamishlovsky Bridge. The machinist so led the train that not a single spark from the steam locomotives was visible. Neither the clatter of wheels nor the clanking of buffers could be heard. Danilich pointed his gun at the booth behind the bridge. The fascists started to use machine guns, but our bow gun fired, and the box was left in splinters. And it began something that is hard to describe. All the guns of the Zelizniakov rumbled. The targets that our reconnaissance had spotted were destroyed one after another. As soon as they hit one, instantly transferred the fire to another, mixing everything with earth and snow. The fascist batteries returned fire but quickly fell silent. The armoured train covered them with its shells. After that, without waiting for the Germans to launch heavy artillery, Zelezniakov withdrew to the Chevrovaya Notch. Here we fired another hundred shells and headed for the Gypsy Tunnel. The train was rushing at full speed, and suddenly the drivers noticed some flickering light ahead. They informed the commander. What is it? Maybe an enemy adjuster is signalling his artillery about the approach of the armoured train. We wanted to fire at the suspicious light, but the commissar said, We must find out. The terrain slowed down. Golovenko with five men got down on the embankment. Marines ran to them. It turns out that an hour ago they accidentally noticed that the enemy shell damaged the track, realizing what it threatens the armored train. The Marines decided to be on duty at the destroyed track to warn the Zelezniakovs of the danger in time. The commander of the armoured train and the whole crew thanked their battle friends from the bottom of their hearts for the rescue. Only then, much later, we learned that the infantrymen were accidentally near the railroad track every time for a reason. Concerned about us, Colonel Potipov specially allocated people to monitor the serviceability of the line to control sections of the track. In the future, we put our own detourers on the tracks 